Welcome to Intergenerational Politics, a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant to all generations. This is Victor Shi. I'll be an incoming freshman next year at UCLA. Also got elected as the youngest Joe Biden delegate and co host this podcast with Jill. And I'm Jill Wine-Banks, the author of The Watergate Girl, based on my uh, experience as the only woman on the Watergate trial team. I'm also an MSNBC legal analyst and uh, have a long government and private practice and corporate career. Um, today, with all of the chaos that we are facing, everything that's happening right now, we decided, Victor and I, that we would take a break from the heavy political coverage and do something that was a bit less current events and more historical for this episode. We both immediately thought of Pete Souza, the chief official White House photographer for presidents Barack Obama and Ronald Reagan. And that's an interesting combination. Uh, Pete is also the author of two wonderful books, Obama, An Intimate Portrait, and Shade, A Tale of Two Presidents. And he is the star of a wonderful documentary called The Way I See It. In addition, he's now known as the King of Shade. And he actually just showed us how he has learned about shade, but we'll, we'll get to that in our interview. Um, you can watch him on Instagram and everywhere else. His King of Shade comes because of the captions that he puts on his photographs on Instagram. And uh, we're very much looking forward to talking about his photography, his experience covering uh, two different presidents, and many other things. So let's get with it. Um, thank you so much for being here, Pete. And I'm going to turn it over to Victor. Yeah, so Pete, I'm so fascinated by your career, both inside and outside the White House. So I guess let's begin by talking about your life before entering the Reagan White House. Um, I watch your a wonderful documentary, The Way I See It, which um, is amazing. You can stream it live on Peacock for free. Um, and in it, you said you didn't really become interested in photography until you took a class at Boston University, um, where you got your undergraduate degree in communication. So first, I'm curious, when you went to Boston University, was that what you planned to do, photography, or what was what was your kind of life trajectory or life goal um, going into college? Um, I think I was lost uh, as, a, as a college freshman, not really knowing what I wanted to do. I was a huge sports man, so I thought I would become a sports writer. Thus, um, I had applied to the, the communications school. Um, and in my junior year, I took a photography class, and I was I was hit by the photography bug. It, it was, I think, it was more the magic of photography than it was photojournalism at the time. Mm -hmm. Just that, you know, this is back in the days where you were making the picture, you were developing your own black and white film, then you were going into the dark room and making your own prints. And it was just that whole process and the magic of that, that I was like, this is what I want to do. I didn't know that I would be able to make a career out of it, but I knew that somehow photography was going to be part of my life. Yeah, for sure. And so after you got your communications degree in, um, uh, at Boston University, you then went on to get a master's in Kansas. And for people in my generation, um, why did you make that decision? Um, and kind of did that I guess, affect the next decision that you made um, as a photographer? Well, I mean, one of the things that happened when I graduated from BU is I couldn't get a job because even though I was, um, you, you know, really interested in photography, I was not that good at it yet. And I had applied for a couple of newspaper jobs in Massachusetts, did not get those jobs and went to work from my uncle's business, which had nothing to do with photography. Uh, for, for a year, and I was miserable. And um, so I, I thought that the next logical step was just go back to school, get a master's degree, and see what happens. And um, Kansas State University happened to offer me a graduate teaching assistantship, um, which enabled me essentially to go to school for free. And they also had a great college newspaper, uh, five days a week, and we uh, we treated it as a real newspaper, and that is where I really honed my skills. 
Sure. And then after that, you went to um, one of Jill's and my hometown papers, which was, uh, which is currently uh, Chicago Sun Times. Um, did that or something else lead to then you meeting Reagan and getting that White House job? Um, if not, like how did how did you come to uh, work in the Reagan administration? You know, when you get to be my age, you you look at back, you look back at all the happenstances that occur in your life. Um, right when I graduated from Kansas State University, I worked for two small college, uh, two small daily newspapers in, in Kansas and uh, aspired to work for the Kansas City Star, which was the big newspaper in, in Kansas, Missouri. Uh, and, and I met the photo director at the Kansas City Star and a woman by the name of Carol Greenwald. And, and I applied for a job. She didn't hire me, but she be, later became the White House photo editor. And when I went to Chicago sometimes, she was paying attention to the work I was doing. And so when an opening came up in the middle of Reagan's first term, she called me out of the blue. And I'll mind you, this is somebody that didn't hire me. And, you know, so I was like, okay, well, I'm never going to hear from her again. And she calls me and you know, didn't offer me the job over the phone, but said, we want you to interview for this job. Um, so that's how that all came about. Hmm. I, I just have to interrupt Victor's questions yeah. for a second, because I'm so amazed at the similarities in our life path. Um, I started college and I ended up having three different majors before I graduated in communications. I went to law school after that because I couldn't get a job I wanted. I was offered jobs on the woman's page, and I wanted to cover hard news or legal affairs or foreign affairs. I didn't want to cover women's teas. And, and so that similarity is just amazing. And then throughout my career, networking has made a huge difference. And I, I, I hope Victor's generation can pay attention to, you never know when you meet someone how it will eventually come back for you to help them or for them to help you. And that's what I'm hearing in, in listening to you. It's just amazing, but sorry, it, it just- No, 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 it, and it, it's, it's um, you, you know, you had the, dis the disadvantage of being a woman in that yes. era, which, you know, I didn't have. But yeah, it's very similar. I, I, I will say that um, later in life when I was uh, teaching photojournalism, I remember saying to my students, Look to the person to your right. Look to the person to your left. Don't piss them off because someday one of them may be in a hiring position. Right. <laughs> you know, and it's because it just, you know, especially when you look back over the last, you know, when I look back over the last 40 years, I never thought of it as networking. It's just like mm -hmm. people that you meet along the way of life where they come back and play a part of your life and you never know which person that's going to be. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's great advice for my generation, who a lot of us are going to be incoming college students, are already in college and kind of figuring out um, what we're going to do in, with our lives. And I think one kind of through line with both your and Jill's career is just, I guess, not having one particular interest that you want to focus on as you go into college, like there may be a class that uh, I take that my peers take that we may find, hmm, like that's that's what I want to do in my uh, career. And maybe that class that sparks that interest. So um, that's fascinating for me to listen to as well. Um, so I guess now then you actually initially turned down the Reagan job. Is that correct? I initially turned down the interview. Okay. When, the interview. when Carol called me, I was doing so well in at the Chicago Sun Times, mm -hmm. and I, you know this thing just her call just caught caught me out of the blue, and I was not you know necessarily a fan of Reagan mm -hmm. or his politics. And when she first called me, I said, ah, "Yeah, I don't think this is something for me." And I thought about it overnight, and I called her back, and I said, "Okay, I want to interview for the job," because mm -hmm. I was like, "You know, this is going to be my only chance ever to work in the White House. Why am I like not giving this a chance?" So it wasn't the job that I initially turned down. It was the, the actual interview. Got it. And then you then took the chance. You got the job. Um, so tell us, like, on the first day of the job, I assume, like, not everyone goes to the White House and, and works there. But how was the transition into the White House um, after working for the Sun-Times? Well, I mean, I was overwhelmed. I, I was in, in my late 20s. I'd never met a president before. And... Um, 
you know, I'm walking into the Oval Office with, you know, his chief of staff who's introducing me to him. And I'm kind of just like blown away. I mean, the Oval Office, yeah. anytime anybody walks into that office for the first time, I mean, I've seen it and years later, it's, it's intimidating. And so it was very, it was very much overwhelming uh, to me to, mm -hmm. to suddenly be on the inside of, of a presidency. And I, I think it took me probably like a good six months to even be somewhat comfortable with being in that, in, in, in that atmosphere. It's such a such a unique position, especially like you said, to be on the inside. And you also mentioned the documentary, how the job is so intense because you literally follow the president every step of the way and capture photos that you know will land in the history book. So I guess like, is there anything that prepares you for that? Or like, how did you deal with the intense pressure um, with the job? I mean, I think that the, there was more pressure probably during the Obama administration. Uh, during the Reagan administration, I was sort of the new guy coming in. I didn't have the level of access that I would later have during the Obama administration. But I do feel that, especially in the second term, I was able to get access to some situations that really helped reveal what was taking place and what he was like as a, as a not just as a president, but as a human being. Um, it, you know, even during um, not some of the best moments of his presidency, I mean, during Iran-Contra, there are some pictures that I made that I think are really important historically. And I think it shows the, the angst that, that he was going through during that whole uh, scandal. Um, and, I, and I also feel that I made some pictures that really showed the intimate relationship between him and his wife uh, and, and, and just him as a, as a, like I said, as a human being. I think we should maybe post on our website some of those pictures because I agree with what you're saying in terms of particularly the relationship between uh, Ronald and Nancy Reagan, between Barack and Michelle Obama. Uh, and, and that stands in stark contrast to the relationships we oftentimes see between a president and their spouse. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, this is more, more true for the Obama administration, but it is true for the Reagan administration too, is the White House photographer is kind of the one person that, that is involved in all the different compartments of a president's life. You know, whether that be, you know, as the commander in chief, as the, um, as the the husband, uh, as for President Obama, as the father, um, you, you you know you you're on vacation with them. You see them in all these different compartments of his life, and and not everybody does. Even the chief of staff isn't there Christmas morning when the Obamas are opening gifts. Uh, so it you, you really uh, are are there for all the emotions of, of his presidency and someday, you know, her presidency. Yes. Well, you certainly were in a fascinating position. And um, I, I think before we continue with your work for President Reagan, let's go back a little bit and just talk about a photojournalist in general um, so that our audience can really understand what exactly a photojournalist and particularly the chief White House photographer does and why that's so important to capturing history and portraying a president? Well, my background is as a photojournalist working for newspapers where you're, you're being dispatched every day, whether it be a news assignment, a feature assignment, a sports assignment, and you're documenting what takes place. And you're then choosing the best picture, hopefully a storytelling picture, that appears uh, the next in the ne next day's newspaper, hopefully of the front page. That's you're always you're always striving to get that front page photograph. So I, when I uh, went to the Reagan White House, it's not like I started taking pictures any differently. You still use the same approach as a photojournalist, even though you're 
clearly you're a government photographer. You're the inside guy. But you're still looking for those moments. And when I say moments, I mean the candid moments, not the staged moments, not the ceremonial moments, but those fleeting moments behind the scenes that really, um, you, you know, show the mood and emotion of what's taking place. Now, during the Reagan administration, there were often times, I wouldn't say often, there were occasional times, which is illustrated in the film, where we, we were asked to, can you do a picture of him, you know, watering the tree on the ranch or something like that. And it's kind of stagey, not, not the kind of work that I was striving to do. Every once in a while during the Reagan administration, I had to do something like that. Not for Obama, though? No. I mean, he understood what I was trying to do. Um, he understood the value of having somebody document, visually document his presidency for history. And quite frankly, it was actually amusing when, you know, if there was a magazine photographer that was given 15 minutes to do a portrait for a magazine cover or something like that, he hated those. And I would be the one that would go to the photographer and say, I know they told you you have 15 minutes, but he's going to get really anxious after about four or five minutes. So make sure you're, you know, your number one setup, you're doing that first because he's going to cut you off because he just hated doing those kind of stagey photos. Well, I will say from looking at your photographs, you did definitely capture um, moments of solitude, reflection, angst, um, and I can list a, a million that I think are iconic photographs. Um, the inaugural pictures where he's alone with Michelle, uh, putting his jacket over her shoulders or riding in the little cart in between buildings. Um, I mean, those are just precious moments um, that just look natural. I, I thought the picture of Nancy and Ronald on horseback looked natural. I don't know if that was staged or not, but I love no, that. It was. And, 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 and I, you know, there are, there are many pictures I made during the Reagan administration that I'm proud of as being, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, authentic and honest and uh, depict what, what was actually happening. I mean, I don't, I can't remember if I sent this one to you. There's one where um, I have a picture of her at, at Bethesda Naval Hospital after her breast cancer surgery. Mm -hmm. And every day after work, he would take the helicopter and go visit her. And I've got this pretty intimate picture of of him kissing her and she's in her hospital bed. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty intimate picture uh, and, it, and it's a real picture. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I, I, let me ask you a different question. Just as a White House photographer, are you supposed to only capture the positive photographs that show the president in a good light? Or are you free to capture anger, uh, frustration? Uh, I, I'm not sure what other emotions might be negative, but um, what are the restrictions? There, there are really are no restrictions. It's, 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 it's the... It, it's it's mostly based on the relationship between the photographer, you know, myself and and the president. And um, I had known Barack Obama for four years before he became president, so we had a professional relationship. I wasn't working for him; I was working for the Chicago Tribune, but I was in his space a lot, and he got to see how I worked. He got to know me a little bit and gave me access and. Uh, he could see that I took my job seriously and all I was trying to do was make, you know, authentic, honest moments. And that's all you can do. I mean, that's what I tried to do during the Obama administration. I, I sort of <laughs> tell people that, you know, those first two years, he was, we were going through the big financial crisis. And there's a lot of pictures where, uh, you know, I wouldn't say he looked very good and he was stressing over the the crisis and some of the decisions that he'd have to make because there wasn't any easy decisions to make, you know, they're all hard. And, um, and we posted a lot of those on our uh, Flickr strike, Flickr uh, photo stream publicly. They laid, 
a lot of those pictures later came back to bite us in a way because they were used in GOP ads in a, you know, sort of out of context situation where, you know, he's looking angst and they're saying it was because of something else when it was about the yeah. financial crisis. You know, that's, that's, that's the risk you take when you're, when you're posting honest photos like that. But I felt that, you know, I did as good a job as I could of, of showing all the emotions that he went through as president. I, I mean, I will say, and this is the one commonality between Reagan and Obama, is they were both had a very even-tempered disposition. So it would take a lot for either one of them to get angry, though I did see each of them get angry. But it would not, it would not happen like every day, um, and, it, and it would just take a lot for 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 them to get to the point where they were really PO'd as as we say. And I think one thing that amazes me with all your photographs and especially watching um, your documentary is compared to Trump, I think there's one photo where they're all in the situation room and you can clearly tell that it's staged with Trump kind of looking into the camera is just, I guess, how natural it was for Obama and Reagan to be under pressure and still having photographs taken of them. And I think for you, you definitely capture that with the emotions and the tone and um, the mood. But for, for Trump, it's just so, I guess, striking to me to see such a clear contrast between Reagan and Obama compared to Trump and um, how those photographs compare. You also, I mean, mentioned- you know, you don't see a lot of uh, behind the scenes photographs of, of Trump. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if the photographer doesn't have access or if they choose not to make those public. I, I, I just don't know. I mean, it's interesting. The one uh, picture that really uh, screams behind the scenes is that picture of, uh, you'll remember, it's of Nancy Pelosi standing in the cabinet room about to leave the meeting. And she's like pointing her finger at him. And the interesting part about that photograph, well, there's many interesting parts about that photograph, but the most interesting part to me was that Trump himself tweeted that photograph out. That's how it became public because he thought it made himself look good. And I think that every other person in the world looked at that picture and said, Nancy Pelosi is a badass and she's standing up to the bullying president. I mean, I think that's how most people saw that photograph. And yet he didn't, which I just find fascinating. Certainly how I saw that picture, for sure. And let's talk a little bit about particularly with Reagan, where you said that you didn't always agree with his policies. And that was one of the reasons that you initially decided you wouldn't interview for the job. Um, Did that ever come up once you went to work for him, where you had to put aside your personal opinions to do your job? Or did, did you just never let that get in the way? I didn't let that get in the way. Maybe I should have. I don't know. I mean, um, I, I, you know, I think back now, um, I, I think I'm more offended by his slow response to the AIDS crisis than I am to Iran Contra, uh, because I could see what his motivation was with trying to get these hostages out of Lebanon, and uh, it, you know, and I sort of understand his mindset on that, it, just in retrospect. Um, whereas you know, the the AIDS, the AIDS, his slow response to the AIDS crisis. Um, is is really it's it's hard to justify now, and I I sort of feel that I wasn't educated myself and that enough, um, and it's hard to put to go back to the 1980s when AIDS first started. But I you know I I don't think I was the only one that felt that uh, the you know the, that that didn't understand this uh, what was happening with with the AIDS crisis. Um, but at the, but I think while I was in the job, I don't think I let anything affect the way I photographed. I just tried to photograph whatever was happening. And as I said, I, there, there's some, um, pictures during the Ron Contra scandal that I'm really proud of that I think show, you know, just how 
the angst that was going through the entire administration. So after covering the Reagan um, administration, you, if I understand your career path, you came back to Chicago and worked for the Tribune. Um, is that the correct sequence? Um, well, I freelanced for nine years in D.C. Oh. Uh, working, working for a little bit for National Geographic, for Life magazine. You know, when you're a freelancer, you work for pretty much anybody that will pay you money. <laughs> um, and then in 1998, um, uh, the, the Tribune approached me about being their Washington-based photographer. And, um, and it wasn't just to cover politics, uh, although that first year I ended up covering politics a lot because of the Clinton impeachment. Uh, but, but over the next uh, nine years for the Tribune, I, you know, I traveled around the world. I covered the war in Afghanistan. I covered the, the war in Kosovo. Uh, I went to China a number of times, Papua New Guinea. Was doing stories really all over the world. And, and, um, and then in 2004, while I was with the Tribune based in Washington, uh, Barack Obama was elected to the Senate. And um, I embarked on this project with, uh, with a reporter, Jeff Zeleny, and we documented Obama's first, pretty much his first year and a half in the Senate. And because we were the hometown newspaper, we got access that, that nobody else got. And that's how I got to meet him and got to know him a little bit. You know, you talk about, you know, the people you run into in your life. That, that is a perfect example where had I not taken that job at the Tribune, had Barack Obama not been elected to the Senate, had he not been the Illinois senator, had I not been based in D.C., you know, none of those things would have come together. So a lot of luck in my life. It's it's not just luck, though, because you were prepared for it, but it is a lesson for Victor's generation, I think, about Absolutely. how you have to be open to these experiences. Uh, you start out down one path and then something else catches your attention. And um, one of the best advices that I ever got, I think one of the best advices I ever got was embrace uncertainty. And I, th and I think that that's a clear kind of trend in, in many successful people's lives. Definitely, sure. definitely true. So, OK, so that's how you met Obama. And what was your first impression? Um, and did you think at that time that he was going to be the superstar that he was and is that he would end up being president and that you'd be going back to the White House? Well, you know, the first, <laughs> it's funny, the, uh, the first time uh, I, I, I made a picture of him was at the 2004 convention. Not when he made the famous speech, okay. because at the time I was uh, traveling with John Kerry, who was the nominee. And he didn't get to the convention until after Obama made his speech. So I never saw the speech. I remember the photo, one, and, but then I traveled to the convention with Kerry. And I remember on the last night of the convention, you know how everybody comes up on the stage at, at the end, there's balloons and all this kind of stuff. I remember my edit, editor in Chicago said to me, make sure you get a picture of Obama if he's up on the stage there at the end on the last night. And I go, who's Obama? You know, <laughs> who are you, what are you talking about? I don't know what, who you're talking about. And, um, and, he, and, and he did come up on the stage that last night. And I have one picture of him. It's a pretty good picture, actually. Um, and then, you know, he, then he gets elected. Uh, and then we embark on this project. And I met him for the first time his first day uh, at, at, uh, in the Senate. The day that he was sworn in was kind of cer ceremonial day, so he's there with his, with Michelle and the, and the girls who were I think three and six then. Um, so I got to meet the family, I got to hang out with him all day, and I was struck by two things: one, that the presence of my camera didn't affect him in any way. So I mean, I've got these pictures of him with his kids uh, on that first day, and it's like really intimate pictures where. Like he's eating a sandwich and Sasha's trying to get the other half and like nobody's even paying attention to me. That's kind of unusual for, you know, a new politician, if you will. 
And then as the weeks went by, I was like, I thought to myself, I could see how this person, Barack Obama, was connecting with other people, both on a one-to-one -one basis, but also just from a podium, the way he delivered a speech, the, the words that he was using, he would, he would hold people's attention. And I could already see, well, this guy is going to be a national figure someday. There's no question about it. And I started thinking to myself, I'm going to make believe that someday he's going to be president. So the pictures I'm making now of him as a senator, I want to like think of these as not just for the newspaper the next day, but as a body of work that if he does become president, these will be a set of cool pictures to look back on. So and I'll give you one example. I, I traveled to um, with him and Dick Luger, former senator of Indiana, to Russia, Ukraine, and Azerbaijan. And when we were in uh, Moscow and he was walking through Red Square, nobody knew who he was. Nobody recognized him. So I was trying to make pictures to show that, that because I figured if he ever became president, you're never going to see another picture like this of him in Moscow where nobody doesn't know who he is. Um, so that's sort of the approach that I took. Wow. Very, very interesting. But I, I have to share a story, which when you said, who's Obama, when I first started at the Chicago Public Schools as the head of career and technical education, one of my very first meetings was with two people from the University of Chicago Hospital one of whom was Michelle Obama, who at the time, this was in, you know, before he was, uh, he, uh, before he was a national figure and before he was elected to the Senate, he was in the Illinois uh, legislature. Um, and it wasn't a name that meant anything to me. And because you will appreciate this, I'm from Chicago. When I took notes of the meeting, which I found when I left CPS. I had spelled Michelle's name O apostrophe B A M A because in in Chicago, if a name is preceded by an O, it's very likely to be O'Brien Obama. Why not? So I still have that notebook of my meeting with Michelle O apostrophe Obama, and I will never forget that. And it just it's. He, he so does have some family. Irish roots you know, from I, his I, mother's I, side. Why not? I mean, <laughs> no, it, it was possible. So anyway. Yeah. So I mean, uh, so lo and behold, you know, President Obama becomes president. Um, uh, one of the best parts about the documentary for me was when you thought to yourself, like, how could it be possible that I worked for one of the most well-regarded Republican presidents, and now I'm working for one of the most famous and iconic Democratic presidents? So I guess what was going through your mind when Obama first won? When he first won the presidency, I went to Grant Park. I, I was then teaching photojournalism at Ohio University, and I and I flew up to uh, Chicago because I figured I had to be there. Um, and it was a magical night. And I, I'll never forget, there's a photographer named David Burnett, who's a little older than me. I think he is the one of the most widely respected photojournalists of, of my generation. And David was in that buffer zone where the um, photographers are uh, that night. And, and I at one point I looked at him and he had like tears running down his face. And he said to me, um, I don't know if I'm going to make any good pictures tonight, but I am so happy to be here. This is such a historic moment. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's what I felt just, I think, the same as many other people. We finally crossed a hurdle in our country and elected an African-American to the, you know, the highest office in the land. Uh, and then a couple of weeks went by and I started thinking, maybe he'll consider me for the job. And I remember I sent uh, Robert Gibbs, who is my main contact with um, with the the president-elect, uh, Robert, was the communications director, but also really one of his key strategic advisors. He is so much more than a communications guy. 
And I sent Gibbs an email and uh, it didn't have any body to the email, just the subject heading. And all I said was, I'm interested. That's all I said. So let's just like put it out there. <laughs> like I didn't need to sell myself to them. Mm-hmm. They knew me. Um, they knew my work. They knew, you know, what kind of person I was. And I had been a, kind of away from the campaign for a year because um, I had left the Tribune and I was now teaching. And, you know, there were other photographers probably they were considering, but I wanted to let them know that I was interested. Um, and then, you know, lo and behold, in, in, in uh, early January, I got a call from Gibbs and, um, you know, my one, uh, I, wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say requirement, but the one thing I said to him is I, I said, I need to, ha-, you know, and this is based on my previous experience with Reagan, where it was kind of like sometimes fighting to get access. What I said to Gibbs was the president-elect needs to know that I have to have access to everything. Mm-hmm. And Gibbs is like, no, he gets it. He, he understands. Um, and, you know, and I, I just I'm reading his book right now and he's, you know, he says that I asked for unfettered access and that, and, and this is in Obama's where he said, and I granted it, you know, no, knowing how I knew Pete or something to that effect. Yeah. And so with that, you know, um, you know, full access to President Obama, do you think that changed the way that you approached photography in terms of, you know, capturing the tone, you know, maybe getting some sort of mood out of him? Or was it just, you know, you knew him and it was basically just the same relationship throughout those eight years? I think having known him uh, beforehand, before he was president and, and um, having a professional relationship with him, having had the prior experience with Reagan, also being a seasoned guy, um, that the, you know, usually the obstacles or access are not necessarily the president, but some of the staff. And I felt I was in a position where no one was ever gonna question my access um, because I had the guy at the top saying it was okay for me to be there big you know it's huge um and i think what that did is it just gave me uh more confidence and more uh being comfortable that i could hang around and some days not much is going to happen but when the shit hit the fan that i would i would be there just as just as i was the day before when there wasn't much going on Mm -hmm. and it and it made it easier i think to navigate every day and make pictures i mean you know we tell you about the bin laden photo or you sort of refer to it yeah um in in contrast to the one of the trump photos there, there was a kind of a not real controversy but there were some where hillary the next day after the photo was released was getting some criticism why did she have her hand up to her mouth right and, and, you know, and she was trying to like say, well, maybe I was coughing. I don't really know. And at one point she said, I didn't realize Pete was in the room. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> the way I approached my job is mm-hmm. I didn't want to be a nuisance. I wanted to be there when things were going on, but I wanted to do it in such a way that I was like, maybe not invisible, but I was so low key about how I went about the job that people really weren't even paying attention to me. Mm-hmm. And, and I think for me, like one of the most interesting, uh, one of the other most interesting parts of the documentary was a few of the changes that you made um, to the Office of Photography by making some of the images available online. You talked about how you, they were released on Flickr. Um, I guess, you know, what kind of prompted that decision? I guess, can you speak to the importance of why releasing photos for the public to access is um, so important? You know, it's interesting that I get credit for that and I shouldn't get any credit in, in, in terms of the decision to, to do that. Um, you know, my thinking was I'm making pictures for history and um, there's this uh, tradition that's been at the White House, I think. I mean, maybe Jill knows. I don't know if she ever visited the Nixon White House, but the, it, it, my understanding that it started the Nixon administration where 
the photography office would hang these 30 by 20 prints on the ground floor of the West Wing. Uh, we called them jumbos. And it, it became, a, you know, a, a cool thing for the staff and the Secret Service when they gave their friends and families tours of the West Wing at night. Not only did you get to see the Oval Office in the cabinet room, but you get to see these cool pictures hanging the walls of, you know, the president and the, what was happening in, in the White House. And I used that as a, as a means. I curated those pictures. And I was like, I'm going to show people what's really going on. All the behind the scenes pictures, I'm not going to like do these ceremonial, you know, standing in front of the flags at a state dinner or something. We're going to show what's really going on. And the staff was like blown away by these pictures. And between January and May of 09, the communications people were coming to me saying, we need to make these public. People need to see these pictures. They need to see what's going on. And I was the holdout because I was like trying to wrap my head around what this would mean. And part of it was I hadn't been on the campaign where they were very transparent about showing him and what he was doing. And there were a lot of behind the scenes pictures and video of him. And I was sort of uncomfortable with making these pictures public. Uh, but the, the communication staff convinced me with one caveat. I said to them, okay, if we're going to do this, then the photo professionals, meaning myself and the photo editor that I had hired, we would choose the pictures that were going to go public. Now, obviously, we would show them to the press office mm -hmm. and they could say, eh, I'm not sure about that one. But I didn't want them like going through all the pictures saying this one, this one, this one, because then it could lead to what Jill was referring to earlier you know, showing just the, the happy Obama or whatever. No, I wanted to right. show what was really taking place. And, you know, if you go, th the, the, by the way, the Flickr photo stream is still online today. It's, it's archived by the National Archives now. And you can go through all the pictures that we posted. And there's like a lot of pictures where he's not even in the picture. Because I wanted to also show the, the, the workings of the, the, you know, the White House staff and just little quirky moments here and there. Um, I do think in retrospect that it was a, it was a valuable to the country to see um, not, not necessarily in real time, but, you know, usually a month later, what was going on behind the scenes. And I think it gave people a real window into his presidency that they may not have gotten otherwise. And do you think that window has changed under kind of based off of your time with Reagan and Obama? Do you think based off what you've seen um, in the Trump White House and some of their photos that have been released, do you think that has changed in terms of the window of kind of, um, I guess, access that we see or photos that we see? I mean, the interesting thing is that the, the, the Trump White House has a Flickr photo stream as well, mm -hmm. and they have posted twice as many photos, more than twice as many photos uh, in four years than we did in eight. Oh, wow. And, you know, they're not very revealing. They're just kind of the ceremonial stuff. And again, I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because the photographer doesn't have access to the behind the scenes stuff or they're choosing, which, you know, they, they're, they have the right to do that or they're choosing not to make those public. But I mean, one thing that you're, one thing that you're, I mean, Jill would be familiar with this and it's as a result of what happened during the Nixon administration when Congress passed the Presidential Records Act. But, you know, every photograph that I made during the Reagan and the Obama administration, every single photograph is now at the National Archives. And that is supposed to be true for the, the Trump White House too. I mean, there's already, you see, there's already historians suing the Trump White House to make sure that they're preserving uh, the records. I don't think they had photographs in mind, but, you know, uh, it, if there were behind the scenes pictures made during the Trump administration, by law, they have to go to the National Archives. And, and I sort of forget 
if it's five years or what it, whatever it is. And in five years, you'd you'd be able to access those photographs or at least FOIA them. So I, I have to answer some of your questions, which are, yes, during the Nixon administration, I was in the Oval Office. And what we were doing there, um, we were working with Ollie Atkins, who was Nixon's White House mm -hmm. photographer, uh, because they would not let the Watergate team bring in our own photographer. And of course, you might imagine that we didn't trust that someone who worked for Nixon would take the photographs we wanted as we wanted them. Um, and with one exception, I think he did. But the the first time I was in the, was next to the Oval Office was uh, when Rosemary Woods did her demonstration. Yeah, yeah, I remember reading about that in your, in your right. book. Right. Yeah. And and the, that photograph, which was taken by Ali Atkins, became the front page of every newspaper and every magazine. Yeah, the stretch. Uh, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that was introduced in evidence in, in the tape searing. Uh, but we went back to go into the Oval Office to get pictures of where the bugs, the, the, the microphones were placed in his desk. I even have a picture of the Oval Office bathroom because we didn't know if there was a microphone in there. Um, and so we were just taking pictures of where the sound would have been picked up. Um, so that was, and then I have been to the White House and the West Wing uh, for most administrations since then and have seen those huge jumbo photos uh, that are up now. I, I certainly saw them during uh, Clinton's administration, during the Obama administration, during the Bush administration. I don't think I was in a place, I, I had a meeting there for Motorola um, about an international uh, problem we were having. And I don't think I saw any photographs on that one. But um, the other place I saw them is in the presidential box at Kennedy Center, oh, yeah, yeah. which I accidentally walked into. <laughs> I was not an invited guest. Um, I was sitting in the box next to it, not realizing it was the presidential box. I didn't like the performance and climbed over to the empty box so that I wouldn't disturb the people in my box by leaving. And when I opened the outer door, I went, <laughs> oh my God, this is clearly the president's box. And let I was with another friend, let's get out of here fast. And she said, we have cameras, take pictures. <laughs> so we did take pictures of the chairs and the photographs on the wall. Um, and as soon as we opened the outer door, you can imagine the guards that surrounded us of what are you doing coming out of the president's oh. box but uh luckily they trusted us and let us go so that's the answer to your question about uh, my experience with white house photographers in the oval office but um going back to uh the documentary and something you 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 mentioned um which is the daily uh routine things that happen the daily life that goes on um, and how you captured that. And in the documentary about you, um, the picture of o Obama uh, sitting down with John Favreau to explain corrections that he, Obama, had made to John's work and his bending down for the young boy who said, could I touch your hair? Um, and I think that just so much captures um, more than if you had just done the ceremonial stuff. And you suggest that maybe the ceremonial stuff is all that's happening, that it's the only photographs. There is another possibility, which is President Trump has not been really engaged in, in the work of governing. And so there may not be the same kind of vaccine pictures that you were able to see. Do you think that's a possibility? I don't know. I mean, I've read, uh, you know, a few books. I read Woodward's book and I read uh, uh, Carol Lennig and Phil Rucker's book. And I mean, it sounds like that there are situations where he is, um, you know, meeting with staff. I mean, just e even recently, it, you know, I was talking about it, just listening to like Ashley Parker and Peter Baker from their sources saying that people do go into the Oval now, but all he's doing is talking about, you know, election fraud and like he's not actually doing the, the business of governing, but he is meeting with other people. 
the question is, is even that stuff being photographed, you know, because that's part of whether you, whether you think it's valuable or not, it is historically, it's, it's part of, you know, the presidency and it should be photographed and whether it is or not, I don't know. Yeah. And what you referred to was uh, Nixon was trying to profit from papers and documents and that's why the Presidential Papers Act was passed, was to make sure that they were government property and that they couldn't be sold by the president. So, I mean, I'll give you, you know, uh, w one example of, of, of what I'm talking about is um, I made photographs every time Barack Obama uh, made a phone call to another head of state, which sounds like, you know, a picture of a phone call is right, pretty boring guy on a phone. But oftentimes, you know, you can you can capture the mood, or you you actually can see who's in the room with him, who's else who else is listening in. Yeah. You know, we just had well, why just this? It actually happened this year. It's hard to believe that it happened this year, but we just had a president impeached for making a phone call, essentially to a, a, a head of state. Uh, and yet we've never seen a picture of that phone call. Like, and I'm curious as to, you know, we've read that it was in the residence, not in the Oval Office, but we've, we've never seen a picture of it. And I would be interested to see who, who else was in the room, where was the call made? Could you detect a mood from the pictures that were made? And yet we've seen nothing. And why is that? And why did, did, did Mueller try to subpoena those photographs if they exist? That's so interesting. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess that wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been Mueller. I guess it would have been Congress that would have, that would well, have uh, subpoenaed. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. It could have been Mueller as well, but there's a lot he, he didn't ask for. So, um, yeah. but uh, so that raises a question about when you're the White House photographer, are there limits on, what you can say publicly on speaking out? Um, oh, for, I mean, while you're in the job. While you're sure. in the job. While you're in the job, absolutely. I mean, I, I never, uh, you know, I think one of the, the reasons that people on the staff trusted in me is, you know, I never talked to reporters. I would right. never talk to reporters. You know, I mean, there was one time when the New York Times was doing a story about uh, his visits to Walter Reed, President Obama's visits to Walter Reed, and the press office asked me to cooperate with the reporter, you know, because I was the one person that went on all those visits just to give them some, like, you know, color, if you will, of what what it was like. But otherwise, I would never talk to reporters, and um, and plus, uh, you know, there's a there's as you well know, Jill, there's something called executive privilege where I, you know, <laughs> so, um, I mean, even, uh, even like, I mean, we, we were, uh, as we were leaving the Obama white house, the, the lawyers briefed us that white house counsel briefed us on, um, you know, just there, there's uh, executive privilege that continues right when you, when you leave. And so, you, you know, I mean, it didn't, <laughs> Not that it mattered that much for the Obama administration. And also, even though I was in a lot of these classified meetings um, where, where they're discussing you know, sensitive topics, as, as I tell people, I, I had the highest security clearance, but I wasn't getting the briefing papers, which is where most of the classified material is contained. I mean, I heard them talking about stuff, but you know, I could never piece together Right. exactly what was classified and what wasn't or you know um so uh no no one would ever want to come to me for information anyway because I, I wouldn't be able to give them an accurate uh reading of what was uh going on when you mentioned Mueller, it raised another thought in my mind which is if i had asked a hundred people on the street could they recognize anyone other than Mueller on that prosecution team? I think the answer would be, except for maybe Andrew Weissman, who's now on MSNBC, and only because he's now on MSNBC post uh, serving in the Mueller team, that no one would. And our press officer at Watergate actually made 
a specific decision that he recommended to Archie Cox. And he required that all of us do, we, obviously we couldn't talk about the case or the investigation, but he wanted us to talk about who we were so that the American people would trust us, so that they would know that we were just trying to get to facts, to the truth. And I, I wondered, did you ever notice that those were sort of invisible people who were then defined by Trump as, you know, 12 evil Democrats out to get me and had no idea who they were. Um, do you, would you, if you had been in the White House um, uh, or in the Mueller team, if you had been working for them, would you have recommended that they show their faces and talk to the press about themselves, not about the case? That's a really good point. Um, and and I and I'll answer this not as a you know former White House photographer or Obama person, but yes, <laughs> I do think it it would have uh, made people feel uh, more comfortable that um, this was on the up and up, that this wasn't a, a witch hunt, and. Um, and and I think it would have put maybe less pressure on Mueller himself. I mean, you know, one of the things that was, um, you know, clear is that you know uh, uh, that that Mueller was kind of like the coach, right? Where and, and all these other people are doing a lot of the work, and he's just over kind of overseeing it. And and yet, you know, th there was this inflated. Um, uh, thinking about him, especially when he came to testify before Congress, that he's going to walk in there and he's going to just knock, you know, Democrats thought he was just going to knock it out of the park where people are going to just come away convinced that Trump should definitely be impeached, you know, I mean, or should definitely be found guilty. Um, and, you know, he's, uh, he was not that good in his testimony, uh, and yet he is at, as an upstanding a person as I've ever met. You know, I got to know him a little bit in the, when he was the FBI director, um, and, and it may have put less pressure on him had we known who these other folks were. Um, and I know a lot of them. I don't, I don't know any of them, but I know some people who know them. The, the other people uh, and, you know, and clearly there were a lot of quality, like, I think they were all like really quality people who were just trying to get to the truth. And had we been able to see them, then, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it would have taken a little bit of wind out of Trump's witch hunt, you know, uh, sale, if you will. I, I wish Jim Doyle had been, Mueller's press officer, because I, I agree with you, and I think it could have made a difference in believability. But before we run out of time, maybe one or two more questions, which is, of course, you are now speaking out. You are no longer the White House photographer, and you have the freedom of any citizen, um, and you've become known as the king of shade. So can you just tell everybody what that means and uh, whether you knew what shade meant when you first got that title? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it's it's funny. I I never watched uh, The Apprentice. I had never watched it, and and I was sort of a little amused in some ways by Trump when he announced that he was running for president, because you know, to me, he was just like a carnival barker, and you know, this is a guy that, even though he knew it wasn't true, s spent a couple years on the birther issue um and and every time he would speak about it he would get he would be on tv he'd be on cnn or msnbc and i thought you know i didn't i was like this guy is not a serious person you know he's just a con man um and so i think after he was elected and before the inauguration so that two and a half month period um i was going through there was a lot of things going through my my head and I didn't know 
what I would be doing after January 20th. Um, but I thought, you know, okay, I think I'll post a few things on my now personal Instagram site that um, just kind of subtly reflects the difference between um, a normal president and this guy. And so I just started posting some throwback photos of Obama with some snarky little captions. And I didn't know if anybody would like get it because I didn't necessarily say what I was referring to. You sort of had to be keeping up with the news. And, you know, much to my uh, surprise, I guess, uh, people got what I was doing. And then right away, they were saying that I was throwing shade. And I was like, what does throwing shade mean? You know, and I kind of had to look it up. And I looked it up and I was like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I, I knew what I was doing. I just didn't know it was called uh, Throne Shade. Um, and I, you know, then over the, 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 the course of his presidency, as he was doing this, Trump was doing things more and more, what I thought were unseemly and disrespected the office of the presidency, my comments became more and more uh, pointed and direct well um i guess before i say my last question i know that you had a pair of shades that you um uh put on right before we went on air and i think that could be an iconic photo with yes that is, <laughs> i think that would be a great way to end this segment throughout your years and you know taking photos and and with the reagan and um, obama administration you've taken thousands of photos what would you say is your favorite photo millions millions of photos million <laughs> millions yeah, I, I I I get asked this question a lot. I, you know, for me, it was always about trying to create the best body of work, and it's hard to like say, oh, well, this is my favorite photo, and and part of it is that, um, especially if you just take the Obama administration, um, if I were to choose the Bin Laden raid, which is kind of like, okay, that's probably the most famous or iconic photo that I, that I made during his presidency. It, it's, it's only like one little compartment of his life of one day. Whereas like, you know, I gravitate more towards the pictures of him with his girls or Jill mentioned the hair like mine where the little boy's touching his head, those fleeting moments that I think really reveal what he was like as a human being. And so I like the, to look at the, my body of work as my favorite photo, as opposed to picking, you know, a singular one. I'll let other people choose their favorite photo of mine. Mm -hmm. That's a cop out answer. I know. <laughs> the best I got the answer because yeah. you have so many dimensions to your work, and you know, I'm thinking of the family photos, the ones, the the sort of snow angel where they're all in the snow, yeah. or where Obama's holding twins in his arms um, or holding, laying on the floor, holding up a baby yeah. uh, or just interacting with ordinary people, normal human beings. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so, really funny. <laughs> we, uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a new grandfather. So we have a, oh. a one, one year old granddaughter and um, oh, it was probably like, six months ago, I was talking to him on the phone, talking to President Obama on the phone. Oh. And I, <laughs> I said, to him, one year old. <laughs> I said, sir, you are going to love being a grandfather. And he's like, no, 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 too soon, too soon. <laughs> I said, I know in 10 years, though, 10 years, you are going to love it. <laughs> Oh, oh my God. Well, this was such a great conversation and Jill and I really appreciate you spending um, time out of your day to talk to us. Thanks so much. You bet. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Pete.